playing hard and safe and going to and going to The funniest thing about my mom is when she reads us funny stories. Um, how she throws food at everyone. Some of uh, the facial expressions that get chucked Dad's way when you forget something, those are quite amusing. The funniest thing is this. <laughs> and it makes me laugh when Mom does it. Uh, that she hasn't disowned me and my brother yet. Uh, can't really say anything the best because everything is good about her. The best thing about my mum would be that she loves us. The best thing about my mum is <laughs> that she takes care of us and she loves us even with our faults. The best thing about my mum is when she reads bedtime stories to me. The best thing about my mum is when she lets me have chocolate. Yeah. Love you, Mum. We love you, Mummy. I love you, Mum. I love you, Mum. Love you, I love you, Mum. I love you, Mum. I love you, Mummy. I love you, Mummy. <laughs> love you, Mum. I love you, Mum. I love you, Mum. Happy Mother's Day. Is my victory in here. 
emptied again the seed I received I will sow 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 to 7 love is patient love is kind it does not envy it does not boast it is not proud it does not dishonor others it is not self-seeking it is not easily angered it keeps no record of wrongs love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth it always protects always trusts always hopes always perseveres
worshipping with us, I'd like to invite Maury up to share some communion with us. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, I hope that you. I hope that you're all well and safe wherever you are. Uh, my name's Murray. I've been here for about four or five years in Bridgeley. Um, I've got an announcement I need to make to, uh, to probably all you guys who've been praying for me for the last seven and a half, eight months. I'm now back at work three days a week, and I can only thank God. The battle still continues, but God is with us. Thank God. When I was asked to um, to do this communion, uh, notice was a little bit short. Now, I couldn't, for the life of me, think of what I needed to talk about. And it wasn't until Thursday night when um, I got a tiny little snippet. And I didn't even know if that was going to work. And God has continued to put just little thoughts into my mind. So I might be a bit broken up amongst all of this, but we'll give it a go anyway. In the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 25, and uh, Jesus is, is hanging on his cross. He's been beaten up, he's been mocked, he's been spat on. And now he's in huge agony, hanging on the cross. And near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, Mary of Magdala. When he saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear mother, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his own home. So even when Jesus was in all that pain, he was still caring and caring for his mother. I kind of had a relationship similar to Jesus' mother as well. I had a mother home in New Zealand and for years and years I had a relationship with a woman who treated me like her son and I treated her like her, my mother and I always called her my other mother. These relationships are, are special and I was just so blessed And now I have a mother-in-law, so that's another mother, so um, I'm doing all right for mothers. So back to Jesus, and Jesus was caring for his mother. He didn't want to leave her alone. And he made a promise to us as well. And in John 14... In verse 15, it says, If you love me, you will obey my command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So again, Jesus cares for us so much. He's done so much for us, but he didn't leave us alone. And another little thought that came to me this morning is, in my Bible, there's all sorts of bits and pieces. And there was a, a page out of an old calendar, and I have no idea how long it's been in there. 
And it was talking about some dude by the name of Wendell Moore. And he was well and his wife, Florence, into the surgical unit of a hospital. And the nurse says to him, you can't go in there. She must go in alone. And he answered calmly, she will not be alone, for the Lord will be there. And he says, it is true. He was with us in sickness. He tenderly healed many. He was with us in sadness. Behold his tears at the tomb of Lazarus. He is with us in solitude. And Paul could say, all men forsook me, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me. And he will be with you and me in whatever sorrow we have today. And wherever we are today, wherever we're feeling lonely and kind of isolated. Jesus and his spirit is with us. So as we take this time, we take the bread and it means the body of Jesus, it's only a symbol. But as we take that and we think of Jesus and what he has done for each of us personally and the juice, the blood that he, he shed for us and he cleansed us through that blood. So as we take the bread and we ponder these thoughts, And the juice, we, we generally drink it together as, as family of Jesus. But first up, I'll, I want to pray. Father God, we thank you that we can talk to you any time, day or night. And without the need of technology, without permission. Lord God, we can call on your name and you hear us. We truly thank you. We thank you, Father, for, for the gift of love which you have given us, for the gift of mothers who have cared for us. And Father, we thank you that when Jesus returned to you, you sent the Holy Spirit to care for us. So, Father, as we take this bread and the cup, we truly, we truly worship you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you. As we take the, the juice and if we we drink it together as as truly blessed children of God, let us drink. Traditionally, at this time, we, we generally pass around a, a bag um, so that we can freely give what we feel we want to give uh, to the work of Jesus, to the running of this church, to keep the lights on. But it also helps, especially at this time, with um, food banks and whatever else, Lord. The Lord has blessed us and may we give some back to him. 
Some do it electronically. You can drop it in at the front office. I just want to thank God also for, for the blessings that he has given us. Father God, we also thank you for, for the gifts that you have given us. Lord, some of us are so, so blessed with, with housing, with full bellies. Some of us still have jobs. Father, all these things are given by you. And as we return just a little of, of what you have given us, we pray that you will accept it with the heart of which it's given. And Lord, that it may be used to, to further your name, to help those in need. True, thank you in Jesus' name. So, there's just one little thought as we head out of here about God being with us. And now that I've put my glasses on, I can't read it. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. That was written in Isaiah 43, verse 2. So God bless you as you um, go through the week, wherever you are. Thank you.
again for worshipping with us. I'd like to invite Kim up to share the message. Well, good morning, church, and a special welcome to all the mothers, the women, as we celebrate this special day together. Happy Mother's Day. And I want to extend it, as I mentioned, to women, because we celebrate the women in our lives that uh, are our sisters, our mothers, our aunts, our grandmothers, our friends, and the compassion and the gentleness that you bring into our lives. Thank you for how you nurture us and encourage us and build us up. You're our mates, you're our supports, you're our confidants. God bless you and may you be blessed this morning as we gather together around God's Word and uh, we bring a word of encouragement. But before we go any further, how about we pray together? Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you that celebration, Lord, is a part of your DNA, a part of your very character and nature. You love to celebrate. You, you show us in the baptism of Jesus, the, the opportunity to celebrate is never far from you. You show us in our own lives that uh, it is always good to, be rem- uh, to remember and be reminded of the goodness of you in our lives and those around us in our lives. So today we want to celebrate and give you thanks for the women in our lives. Lord, as we press into your word, may you guide us, may you reveal to us something fresh from your word. Lord, may we leave this encounter with your word different today. We commit it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a young boy who uh, came into the department store one day and invaded the women's area. His intent was to find something to, to purchase for his mother. He's looking around and he's a little bit sheepish as he comes to the sales clerk and inquires where the the nightgowns would be that he could buy for his mother. With a little bit of a wry smile, the sales clerk's response was, well, it'd be helpful if I knew what your mother was like, what her size was. Is she short or is she tall? Is she skinny or is she larger? beaming, this small boy's response was priceless. She's just perfect. Without a moment of hesitation, the sales clerk grabs a size 10 nightgown, packs it up, gives it to the small boy, and off he trots. A couple of days later, mum would return to the store to exchange the size 10 for a size 14. It's interesting when we think of things, we, we fail to understand the, the intent behind them at times and we, we misunderstand what is trying to be communicated. This young boy was desperate to communicate the perfection that he saw in this wonderful woman in his life, his mum. Now, before you get cross with me this morning, because I know it's a passage of Scripture that you and you and maybe other women uh, get a little bit nervous by. And maybe even one or two men in your life have used it as a means of expectation. But Proverbs 31 is a special piece of Scripture. Proverbs 31, 10 to 31, is a piece of Scripture that points us towards something very special. And it's maybe not what you think. So before you shoot me down, before you think that I'm here to raise the bar, God has already done that in each of our lives. I'm here to hopefully reveal something special, remove uh, a cliche, a misconception of this passage of Scripture. So if you've got your Bible, why don't you open to the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. We're going to start at verse 10. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her and she will greatly, uh, will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. 
She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She is like a merchant's ship, bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her household and plan the day's work for her servant girls. She goes to inspect a field and buys it with her earnings and she plants a vineyard. She's energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Her hands are busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fibre. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her, um, for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her own bedspreads. She dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gates where he sits with the other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell at the mer- to the merchants. She is clothed with strength and dignity and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. Now, I know, on face value, this passage of Scripture is overwhelming, daunting. And if you're a woman, how are you ever to aspire to this? But today, I want to point out a few things to you, that this is less daunting than you think, and that this is not an expectation, but rather an insight into the women around us. It's, it's an opportunity for us to to see what is at play, at stake around us in the lives of women, that this is not something that uh, is to be nurtured um, to to one day take root in the life of of a woman, but rather that is already there. We'll get to the nurturing part a little bit later, but we've got seven things that I'd love for us to share this morning with you. And uh, we talk about the goodness of a godly woman. Well, these are the seven signs of godly women that will bring goodness into any home, into any relationship. And so we're going to start with this idea of priceless value. And so we're going to look at each stanza that comes from verse 10 through to verse 31. And they happen in about two or three verse increments. And our first one is this priceless value. And so if you've got your Bible, why don't you flick back to verse 10 as we read it. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She's more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. And so we have this picture here of incredible priceless value, intrinsic value. But also there is this reference to rubies. Now, in other places in Scripture, particularly in Proverbs and Psalms, we see the reference of rubies to wisdom. This is a really poignant fact. We see it here referencing treasure and the idea is is that a great woman holds value that is worthy of being plundered, of being drawn upon. We're going to get to that a little bit more soon. But this treasure is like hidden treasure, that there is a pursuit after it, that there is a necessity of it in one's life. And women are the, the, the holders, the bearers of such treasure. They are the treasure. A good woman or wisdom is linked to this treasure, this treasure represented by rubies. Rubies are linked to a man lacking nothing. Men, I hope we're listening this morning, young and old, that there is an understanding that if we have an incredible woman in our life, they are worthy. They are worthy of our attention, of our blessing. They are valuable to us. And if we have them in our lives, we lack nothing. This is a pretty incredible piece of Scripture. And so we have this incredible 
um, idea that if diamonds are a girl's best friend, then rubies are a man's. You see, the, 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 the proverb writer, Solomon, he's trying to communicate this idea that there is a, an, in, an incredible wisdom that comes from knowing a good woman. We then go on to number two. And we see that a good woman, a godly woman, is a provider and a planner. Why don't you look at verse 13 to 15 with me? We'll see it there. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She is like a merchant's ship, bringing her food from afar. She gets up before dawn to prepare breakfast for her house side and plans the day's work for her servant girls. This is what I remember my house being like. I remember mum making sure that we were all clothed, uh, that we had warm things to be in. I also remember that our pantry never seemed empty. And I'd, I'd tried it really hard to make sure that it was empty. I, we had a, a slow-cooked meal on Friday and uh, it brought back all these memories of when I came home from school. You see, my mum was still working um, before, um, and uh, rather before she got home, I would see the slow-cooked meal on the bench and I would sneak some. And before long, I've discovered that mum had two slow cookers, one for me when I got home from school and another for dinner. A great woman seems to have these uncanny abilities to make things happen unbeknownst to us. And we don't even know. It's, it's like there's a room fairy. Our rooms are always clean. Clothes are always provided. Food is always on the table. A good woman is a provider and a planner. Even when there's a son in the house who seems to want to try and eat one out of house and home. It's a great picture that I... I see here, and, and not one for us to be daunted by, or oh, ladies, not one for you to be overwhelmed by. You see, these values are not here for you to be overwhelmed or feel a sense of falling short, but rather to see that they are evident in you, that you are nurturing these things, not only in the men around you, but in the women around you. We see it that um, the woman is the glue within a household. It makes the house tick. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that? It's, it's, it's very true that in most stereotypical households that uh, the man is out working, uh, you know, to bring home the income, but it is, it is the woman, it is the, uh, the mum that is doing everything else to make sure that family unit functions how it should. What a picture. We go to number three, and we see that this is the evidence of hard work and selflessness. One of the great things I've been challenged by and continually tried to, to, to model in my own life is the, the hard work and selflessness displayed by my wife. It is a challenge just to see the commitment that she has to everything in her life. And we see it highlighted here in verse 16 through 18. So if you've got your Bible, flick back there and we're going to read. Verse 16, she goes to inspect a field and buys it. With her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She's energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. It's interesting that many of us stereotype and stigmatize women by making statements of being chained to uh, a bench or a washing machine. We would even suggest that in ancient times, in the, the, the nation of Israel, that women were probably of less value, but the wisdom of Solomon is coming out here, where he's actually speaking to an entire nation, and in turn us, in our day and age, reminding us that women are far more valuable than what we give them credit for. This is the Word of God to us this morning. That we'd be reminded of the godliness that exists in our women. It's a, great, it's a great thought for us to be reminded of. This morning, I wonder, 
Do we actually understand what it actually means to see this level of hard work displayed for us on a regular basis? What she earns is invested. Not only is her hard work displayed, but it's reproducible. It's reproducible in the lives around her. She is shrewd and calculated. I remember my mum being a shrewd, <laughs> a shrewd person to work with growing up. I never messed with my mum. She was calculated and, and measured in what she did and how she did it. And I've noticed that in my wife now. Serena is very measured. She's very shrewd. She knows how to run our household and she works hard. And it's interesting that, that when, when my wife when my wife is succeeding at what she does in the house, our household seems to avoid threats, calamity. We're going to talk a little bit more about how we can amplify and uh, nurture that more and more in our homes and in our relationships. Number four, we see that uh, another sign of godly women is gener- she is generous to not only her family, but also those well beyond her. I must say that I am not naturally a generous person. I have discovered that my generosity has come from my relationship with my wife. She is a very generous person. Not just with a particular, not just with time, not just with a particular possession, not just with finances, with everything. I find this is a natural trait on the whole that we see within women. There is that nurturing, compassionate characteristic. If you've got your Bible, flick to verse 19. We're going to read actually two stanzas now through to verse 24. Her hands are busy spitting thread, her fingers twisting fibre. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her own bedspreads, she dresses in fine linen and purple gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gates, where he sits with other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell to the merchants. You see, we're not trying to suggest that we all need to be seamstresses, you know, and that if we're not doing that, we are falling short. This is about a measured response, that we fulfill the needs of those in our family and those beyond. I see this every day. We are a very generous church and I see women throughout our church, men too, but women speaking specifically about their generosity, about filling the needs within our community. Solomon speaks of this and he highlights this for us, reminding us that there is godliness in this behavior. There's this phrase that that comes up in these two stanzas where she, she turns her palms out. It's a giving motion that she never tries to hold on. It's almost, imagine holding on to some sand when you're at the beach and you squeeze tighter and tighter and you watch the grains of sand push out between your fingers. That's the opposite of what is being suggested here. Rather, palms out, it's, it's this, I, I'm not even going to try and attempt to hold on to it because I'll lose it anyway. I'm going I'm to freely give. I'm going to be generous with what I have. I'm going to bless those around me. And not only do we see it having a, uh, an effect, a positive effect on the family unit, but it spills out beyond that into the families and neighborhood around. A godly woman dispenses generosity as a natural habit, a natural characteristic that she displays, a contributor to all areas of society. And there are no chains involved here. We need to change our language as men, don't we? We ostracize, belittle and demean women simply by our jokes. I'm guilty. I've been involved in those conversations in the past. And the more I read this, the more I am challenged to see women flourish, to see them understand who God has called them to be and the role that they play in our lives. 
we see that women in the, you know, both the previous uh, point that we raised and in point four here, that women are contributors, not just to the things that we want them to contribute to, but to so much more. So we've got uh, the fifth point. The fifth sign of a godly woman is that wisdom and vision are her personal dialect. I love seeing this at work in families and women they because spend a lot of time with their children in making a home out of the house. They have this vision for things and the ability to speak into things, but they also have that wisdom. They have the ability to see that, that circumstance and situation and offer advice. If you've got your Bible, flick to verse 25. She is clothed with strength and dignity and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Now, this idea of laziness, you must understand, is in the context of what we've just read. We've all had those moments where we need to to rest on the couch. We're not talking about that sort of laziness. It's a vigilance. It's It's understanding that there are needs to be met within the household. Did you hear those words that were echoed? She is clothed with strength and dignity. Verse 25 is an incredible passage um, of Scripture. It's reminding us that she's not just anyone in the context of the family. And what she has to bring offers strength and dignity. The information, the wisdom that she's about to bestow is worth listening to. Experience and knowledge provide a well to draw from. I love to say to people that a church is a well in the community and sometimes they will go far away, but they always know to return to the well. A good woman is a well to draw from. And though we may have times where we're not seeing eye to eye, they are always someone we can come back to and be encouraged to be supported, to receive wisdom. Faithfulness and kindness are staples in her communication. Women have an incan- un- uncanny ability to be faithful and kind. That's been my experience. Trust me, they can be to the point, they can be brutal when they need to be. We've talked about the shrewdness of women, but we also understand that they are faithful, kind, loving creatures in the image of God. The sixth sign of godly women is one of my personal favourites, and actually, it's actually something that we as men have an active role in. It comes from um, verse uh, 28 and 29, but it's a, it's a need for us to understand that we, we are a people, we as a, as a group of men must understand our role. You'll notice that at the beginning of verse 10, there was an emphasis and a highlight that men get the benefit and the blessing. Well, as we enter verse 28, we see that we are the ones that draw out these characteristics. You see, ladies, this isn't all on you. It's it's actually a partnership. Do you remember at the garden where Adam had God allow him to fall into a sleep? A rib was taken from his side and he fashioned woman. Adam's response was like, wow, this is amazing. But they were brought together. They were meant to complement. That they would both flourish and and thrive. And so we see this here with point six, that she is to be celebrated, that godly women are celebrated. Well, if if a woman was to celebrate herself, that would be a little bit conceited and, and, and odd. So this is actually a challenge by by Solomon to us as men. And this will become more apparent as we go along. So if you've got your Bible, verse 28, her children stand and bless her, her husband praises her. Verse 29, there are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. It is suggested that that is the head of the household declaring that upon his wife. It is so necessary for us as men to celebrate, to champion the celebration of women around us, not to demoralize and diminish their value, Celebration, not just from an external source. You see, 
one of the greatest things that I'm challenged by in my own marriage is that I hear of the praise that comes to my wife. I want to be the one that celebrates her as well. I should be the one that celebrates her too. Celebration is led by men. Solomon is, Solomon is saying, don't become lazy in this, men. Don't become acclimatized to just simply the benefits of having them around. Spoil them, encourage them, celebrate them. Number seven, dovetails with this. But it, it speaks and comes full circle to this idea of goodness is found in godly women. Because beauty is discovered in the godliness shown throughout these verses we've read today. Verse 30 and 31. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. What great words that we should be encouraged by. But again, men, this is, this is a challenge for us. Who would have thought that on Mother's Day we'd be speaking to men as well in the context of this passage of Scripture? But Solomon meant it for that. He meant for us to understand that we are to complement each other, to affirm each other and build each other up, to see these qualities in the women around us and celebrate them. Because her nurtured behavior and spirituality are valued above physical beauty. Her value is beyond the family, not just an appendage. You see, these two points are important. Because we're not suggesting that she is not beautiful. Solomon has already discussed that in the verses that we've read, about how beautifully she's presented and dressed. You know, that there's a radiance that comes from her. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about this incredible characteristic and beauty that comes from from the actions that she bestows upon those around her, that she nurtures this behavior in, and spirituality, that we see her value beyond the family, that she isn't just an appendage, something that we can uh, pick up and pl- put down when we feel like. And so this morning to conclude, I want us to contemplate the ideas that we have read about today. Firstly, for the women, there are a few things here that we can take home. And the first is know your worth. Know your worth as a woman. Know your worth as a mother, as an aunt, as a sister, as a grandmother. Know that you are worth something. For God has intended you to be created in the image. He purposed for you to be made in His image with a direction and a cause to live, a purpose to live. Your skills are more numerous than those which service a man. We need to hear that this morning. You need to hear that this morning. That you are gifted, that you are talented, that you are a contributor, not only to your family, not only to your friends, but to our world. You have things to contribute. And you will flourish when you are living in your purpose. You will abound when you are celebrated. Now, I know, men, you probably understand what's coming. But the, the, the male response to this is quite similar. We are to remind them of their worth, of their value. We are to see their skills and see them that they are more numerous than those which service ourselves. We will see that they will flourish when we let them fly, when we allow them the opportunity to be involved and to do things. And we will see them abound when we celebrate them and champion them instead of diminish them and devalue them. May this Mother's Day be the opportunity that we all need to celebrate the women in our lives and bless them with the knowledge that they are valuable. May God bless you as you celebrate. May He encourage you as you gather in small groups with your mums. And may it be a blessing to have that special woman in your life. Let me pray. God, thank you for the time that we can have today. Thank you for this passage of Scripture. Though it gets a little bit of bad press and women can sometimes feel overwhelmed by it, may we be reminded today that this is not solely dependent on a woman, but rather that we are united together in Jesus Christ.
to flourish, to champion and affirm and celebrate each other, to see each other fly. I pray that as we celebrate the women in our lives today, may you bless this time. We thank you, Jesus, for these special people. And may they know today just how valuable they are and the blessing they are to us. In Jesus' name, amen. joining us in our service this morning. Uh, may you be encouraged by what was shared this morning. Um, hope the mums tuning in have a lovely Mother's Day and I pray for comfort for those who uh, are doing this alone or um, have lost their mums. Um, of course, shout out to my mum who's probably watching this morning from Perth. Love you lots, mum. <laughs> um, anyway, hope you can join us next week in our service. Uh, take care and God bless. <laughs>